Hi, today we are going to learn a new topic, which is inflation, money growth, and interest rate. For this part, uh, the course targets are uh, understanding the difference between nominal and real interest rates. And then we are going to talk about uh, market equilibrium when there is money, and then talk about the property of the neutrality of money. And then we are going to define um, how the real interest rate is determined by the open market equilibrium. For this part, uh, you need to read uh, textbook chapter 10 and 11. First, we want to learn the difference between nominal and real interest rate. To understand the purpose of learning, we need to reconsider the motivation of saving. Basically, when the person saves, what they care about is not really the money that uh, he can get. What they care about is the purchasing power. So uh, the exact question that a saver is going to ask is how much purchasing power do I get tomorrow for each unit basket of consumption that I sacrifice? So for the person, if he's willing to uh, sacrifice eating one basket, and given the fact that this basket actually costs P1 dollars, then sacrifice eating this basket now imply that he's going to save in the bank P1 dollars. And given the interest rate to be I1, then tomorrow the bank will pay him back P1 times 1 plus I1. But the happiness of a consumer is coming from his consumption. So tomorrow he will use this part of money to buy basket back for consumption. But tomorrow the basket price may be different. That's why we're using the notation P2 to denote the basket price tomorrow. So if you use this money, 1 plus I1, P1, to buy basket, you will be able to buy uh, this much, this many units of basket, which is the money divided by P2. So if we answer the question on the top of this slide, it will imply that sacrificing one unit of basket of consumption today would get you 1 plus I1, P1, divided by P2 unit of consumption tomorrow. So because of price can change, there will be an inflation rate. So we assume the inflation rate, we denote it as P, pi 2. So pi 2 imply the inflation rate from today to tomorrow. So uh, for the number basket we can get tomorrow, we can change P2 to 1 plus pi 2 P1. So we can cross out all the P1 and then we use the approximation that such kind of a division it will be approximately equal to 1 plus I1 minus the inflation rate pi 2. So this extra the unit that attached to 1 is actually called the real interest rate, which means the extra unit of basket you can get for one unit of basket you save today. So this is called real interest rate. It is the rate of return for baskets. So when a person say what he really care is the real interest rate, it's not just I1, it's not just the nominal interest rate. And uh, if suppose the uh, real interest rate 10%, then it will mean that for a household who is willing to sacrifice 100 units of purchasing power, then uh, he will be able to get 110 units purchasing power back. So uh, if we put this knowledge in practice, it means that when a person goes to a bank and he saw the saving interest rate to be 10%, this would be the nominal interest rate that we can get for money saving. And the person will start to think about what is the inflation rate going to be tomorrow? If it is 3%, then for this person, such kind of a saving behavior actually will give him a real interest rate R1, which is equal to only 7%, which means that whenever he saves one basket in the bank, he get extra 0 0.07 unit back of purchasing power. And for this part, there's something we need to clarify further. For the inflation rate pi 2, it is something that we cannot really uh, be sure today because it's related to price level tomorrow. 
So in reality, we need to put expectation there. So actually, what happened is that when we see the interest rate in the bank bulletin board, we start to think about the expected inflation rate. And given the expected inflation rate, we will be able to calculate the expected real interest rate. And actually, our consumption behavior actually is really governed by this expected real interest rate. The higher the expected real interest rate, the lower the consumption, which means I will be willing to save more. The lower the real interest rate expectation, then I will in decrease my consumption, then I will, uh, then I will increase my consumption, then I will decrease my saving. So consumption actually is, is, neg is negatively related to the expected real interest rate. And in the past, uh, we don't talk about price change. So in the past, our inflation rate is always zero. That's why in the past, we assume that consumption is negatively related to the nominal interest rate. Because in this case, when inflation rate is zero, real and nominal rates are the same. But in practice, to be more rigorous, actually, it should be the expected real interest rate that govern consumption behavior. Now we want to talk about market equilibrium when there's money and the neutrality of money. Uh, the market that we learned in the past, the first one is labor market. And basically there is a labor supply, which is actually positive slope with the real wage rate because the uh, household work incentive is fully governed by real terms about the purchasing power he can get for working. And then we get the uh, labor demand curve. The labor demand curve is actually uh, related to productivity of labor. The intersection of both curves will determine the equilibrium weight, real wage rate, which is, is how many baskets of consumption he can get through working for each hour, and how many hours he is willing to work, which would be L star here. And then uh, this uh, wage rate, be careful, it is real wage rate. It is the real wage rate that matter for labor. And then we move on to capital rental market. For the capital rental market, we have a capital supply curve, which is uh, vertical because we cannot change it today. And there is a, a capital demand curve, which related to the productivity of capital. And the intersection of two curves would determine the uh, equilibrium capital and the real rental price. Again, this is the real price, so it is the unit of basket that uh, people who rent out the capital can get. So here I assume it's a 500 unit. So, it's 500 unit is the real capital rental price, okay, which is a nominal price divided by price level P. And then, we have an uh, actual equilibrium condition, which is non equilibrium condition for this chapter. And uh, for this equilibrium condition, we assume there is a vertical money supply curve. And then we know that we have a money uh, demand curve like this one. The intersect of these two actually would determine the equilibrium price level. And this equilibrium price level actually is the price level of a basket of consumption. So uh, if uh, we have those three equilibrium conditions, it would mean that labor market, we know there is equilibrium L star and the real wage rate is 100 basket. And then capital market equilibrium give us the equilibrium capital star and the real rental price to be 500 basket. And then the money equilibrium would determine that uh, uh, what would be the equilibrium price level for each basket, which is 20 in this case. So if we know the real wage rate is 100 basket, and we know each basket will cost $20, then the nominal wage rate in terms of dollar would be simply 20 times 100, which would be $2,000 for each hour of working. So this would be the nominal wage rate. And then the, the same for the nominal rental price, R star. In equilibrium, it would simply be the 500 real rental price times each unit of basket costs twenty dollars, which would be ten thousand dollars for the uh, for the rental price for renting one unit of machine. 
So uh, basically, what we have here is that no matter capital market or labor market, both in equilibrium will determine the real price for both inputs. And if we want to know the nominal price, we need to go to money equilibrium to find out what will be the equilibrium price level. And then we'll be able to figure out what will be the nominal equilibrium uh, wage rate, and we will be able to find out the equilibrium nominal rental price. Okay. So suppose now government increase money supply so that uh, the new price level for a basket would be 30 now. Then uh, we want to ask what would happen to labor and capital markets at equilibrium. And uh, basically for this market, uh, we have to see whether the labor supply or labor demand curve will shift. First, productivity has nothing to do with money. So no matter government print more money or less money, it will not shift the curve. LD will not change. And uh, as to the labor supply curve, working incentive is purely driven by the purchasing power in the wage contract. So um, actually, no matter government print more money or less money, and in our uh, discussion in the class, we know that money does not really create any wealth effect. It does not to make the household feel wealthier or poorer at all. So it should not change household working incentive. So labor supply curve will stay the same no matter how much money government print. So that's, then the labor market equilibrium actually will stay put. It will stay in the same situation as before. And now we move on to a uh, capital rental market. Again, for capital demand, productivity has nothing to do with money. So it will not change its position. And as to capital supply, which in the short run it will not uh, change and by money, it is fixed. Even for the long run, capital supply is really related to investment. And uh, later we'll see that investment actually purely driven by the benefit of investment, which is capital productivity, and which has nothing to do with money either. And then also it will be driven by the cost of investment, which is related to the incentive related to saving, which is real interest rate. And later we will discuss about it. It has nothing to do with money either. So uh, no matter government put print more money or less money, it will not affect capital supply. So the equilibrium rental market capital rental market will be the same. So based on what we have so far, what we have is that if government print more money so that the basket price changed from 20 to 30, the only thing that it would change is the uh, nominal wage rate now will not be 2,000, it will be 3,000. Because now for for worker to agree with the working deal, you need him to be able to buy 100 basket. Each basket now costs $30. So you need to pay him $3,000 per hour. And the same thing applies to uh, rental price. Nominal rental price in equilibrium will not be 10000 It will be 15000 because now you have to pay him 500 units of purchasing power in order to rent one unit of machine. Each unit machine costs you now $30. So the rental price goes up to be $15,000 now. As you can see that everything that changed here, they are all nominal. They are all something uh, uh, counted in terms of money. But for this part, these are all real terms. These are the hours of working and the unit of machine and the purchasing power in terms of unit basket we can get for working and for rental, these are all real terms. These real terms are unchanged. They are not affected by uh, the supply of money, the equilibrium money quantity in the society. And remember, output is determined by uh, how many input you put in. And the input L and K star here, they are not affected by money either. So actually, uh, upper level will not be affected by money as well. So here what we get is that no matter government print more money or not, it will not affect all the real terms including output. This property we call the neutrality in money. 
that is money is neutral. Now we're going to uh, talk about upper market equilibrium. This is the market that uh, will determine the equilibrium real interest rate. And uh, to begin with, we already talked about consumption earlier, which is related to saving. And the motivation of saving and consumption for intertemporal choice is related to the real rate of return, which would be the real interest rate. And we already know it is next slope uh, with the real rates. And then to, uh, the other part of the uh, output demand is uh, the investment. To understand the investment's relationship with the real interest rate, we consider uh, that a firm is thinking about borrow money to uh, invest one unit of machine. And we assume that uh, capital machine has the same unit price as a basket of goods. So if the price level for basket P1, then the unit price for a machine would be P12. So in order to buy this machine, the firm has to borrow P1 dollars from, uh, from bank. And if you borrow this amount of uh, money from the bank, given the interest rate for bank is I1, then tomorrow you have to pay back this amount of uh, money for your investment. And this part will be cost of investment. And now we're going to talk about the benefit of investment. The benefit of investment is that uh, one unit of machine can produce uh, uh, goods for you. How many units it can produce actually is uh, described by its marginal productivity of capital tomorrow, MPK2. So one unit of machine will produce this many units of uh, output tomorrow. And given that the, the basket price tomorrow is P2, then uh, this part of output would generate the cash income of P2 times MPK2. But that's not the entire benefit. Remember, you own the machine, and the machine, after you use it for production, you still have a one minus delta unit of machine on your hands, which has certain market value, because the machine price is P2 as well, so if you really sell the entire machine, it would generate extra cash income, which is P2 times 1 minus delta. So together, these two income together would be the total benefits of investment. So whether we want to invest uh, a machine or not depends on the cost of investment and the benefit of investment. And these are all uh, tomorrow's money. So of course, uh, what's important is that how much purchasing power these money worth tomorrow. So actually, we want to uh, calculate cost and benefit in terms of tomorrow's purchasing power, which means we divided this money term by P2. So if we divide it by P2, the left hand side would be uh, 1 plus I1 P1 divided by P2 and the right hand side we would have uh, no P2 term there. Then once we divide it by P2, the cost of investment and the benefit of investment uh, they are all in terms of tomorrow's purchasing power. And now we focus on the cost of investment. Remember, uh, uh, the price can be different, so there is an inflation rate pi 2. And we can change p2 to be 1 plus pi 2 times p1. And then we cancel p1. And then we know that such kind of division can be approximated by 1 plus i1 minus pi 2. And again, you can see that what governs the cost of investment is actually the real interest rate. When the real interest rate is higher, the cost of investment will be higher. Therefore, we will decrease our investment today. So, in the past, we draw investment demand to be negative slope line with the nominal interest rate. But to be more precise, what we should put down here should be the real interest rate. And again, of course, uh, today, we cannot really see the exact inflation tomorrow. So the real interest rate here should be the expected real interest rate. 
So now we have uh, both a consumption demand and investment demand to be negatively related with expected real interest rate. Therefore, if we sum them together and plus G, then we get the aggregate demand curve to be negatively related to the real, uh, the expected real interest rate. And now we want to talk about uh, aggregate supply, YS curve. We have to look at the labor uh, equilibrium and uh, how is this affected by the real interest rate. It is mainly working through intertemporal substitution effect. So consider that uh, the household thinking about one unit of working today and save it for tomorrow's consumption. Then what will be the trade-off? One unit of working today actually can earn him W1 unit of W1 dollars. Okay. And if you save this amount of uh, wage income in bank and then given the interest rate to be I1, tomorrow he will be able to get 1 plus I1, W1 dollars back. And uh, in terms of purchasing power tomorrow, the unit of basket that he can buy would, should be divided by the price level of basket tomorrow, which is P2. So this amount of money income tomorrow will be able to uh, buy him 1 plus I1 W1 divided by P2 units of basket. So the exact intertemporal trade-off is that one unit of hard working today is able to buy this household 1 plus I1 W1 divided by P2 units of basket. And now we want to uh, elaborate this term further. We further insert P1 you know, on both nominator and, de and denominator. So, and we uh, switch the position of the last two terms. And then P1 divided by P2 term, actually it is, it is actually 1 divided by 1 plus pi 2. Okay. So actually, uh, it will be the 1 plus I1 divided by 1 plus pi 2 times the real wage rate that you can get uh, today. And for the, the division for the first term, 1 plus I divided by 1 plus pi, we know it can be approximated by 1 plus I1 minus pi 2. As you can see that the intertemporal substitution effect on labor is governed by, again, the real interest rate as well. Whenever the real interest rate is higher, working one more hour can give the worker more basket purchasing power back tomorrow. So, which means that intertemporal benefit of working increase, which means that he will be willing to work more. At the end, of course, equilibrium employment rate level in the economy will be higher, which means the economy will be willing to produce more. So which means that we will get a positive slope aggregate supply curve in relationship with real interest rate. And here, of course, it is expected real interest rate. So uh, together with the aggregate demand, we will be able to determine the equilibrium uh, expected real interest rate and the equilibrium real output. And uh, if in the economy, uh, household expect inflation rate tomorrow is going to be 3%, then for him to be willing to save, then the equilibrium nominal interest rate should be 3% plus 5%, which would be 8%. So equilibrium nominal rate would be simply the sum of the expected inflation rate and the expected real interest rate that govern by the equilibrium output market condition. Mm -hmm.